Um, well, this is a typical machine of a type that was manufactured in very large numbers. It's, it's a genuine wartime machine of some age now, which always gives me slight fear and trepidation when I use it, because it doesn't always work as well as it might, but uh, I think the best this morning. And this was made, I think I said, in, in, in very large numbers, about 50,000 or so. It's probably not wider than mark. And the machine of this type would be uh, standard issue to the uh, all the communication sections in the German armed forces. But the details of the machines varied slightly. The Army and the Air Force had a particular version of the Navy. Their machine was slightly different in its appearance, but uh, uh, it operated in the same way. Uh, although the, the way in which the Navy, how they actually used the machine, was somewhat different from that of the Army and Air Force. And the remarks that I'm going to make this morning are simply concerning the Army and Air Force, because that was easier uh, and it's so much more straightforward to deal with in a short demo. Well, it looks like a typewriter, basically, uh, but it lacks certain features that you'd normally see on typewriters. Uh, it doesn't have a space bar. Uh, there's no way in which you can put gaps between groups of letters. It doesn't have the facility to enter directly numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, or punctuation marks, brackets, or lowercase letters. Everything had to be done with the 26 capital letters of the alphabet, and so there they are on the keys. Now, in above the keys is a flat surface here, and it's been cut, and there are 26 little circular windows in it. Each window is lined with a disk of transparent material, engraved with a letter of the alphabet, and the letters on the windows match up with the letters on the keys. Now inside the machine, uh, underneath those windows, uh, and in registration with them, are 26 tiny lamps, very much like those you'd find in an ordinary electric torch. And indeed, the machine, when it was used in, in its portable mode, shall we say, uh, that these lamps were lit by means of a, a dry battery built into the machine in the box here. Now, underneath each key, uh, to explain how the machine operated, there are sort of two stages uh, of explanation required. First one is very simple, the electrical procedure in a sense. Underneath each key there is a switch of a special type, and when you press down on that switch, it will complete a circuit, closes, the switch closes and completes a circuit, and that will make one of these lamps light. And the lamp that lights up indicates the cipher character corresponding to the plain text letter that has been entered on the, on the keyboard. Uh, and that's pretty obvious and straightforward. Uh, however, it might suggest, quite incorrectly, that, that would mean that every time you pressed a particular key, the same lamp would light up. That doesn't actually happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is that the uh, there's another aspect of the uh, machine which, which, which we now try to explain. Um, in addition to closing the switch when you press on the key, the motion of the key has another effect. Through a mechanical linkage, which you can't see that's built into the machine, the motion of the keystroke causes the rotors at the back, these wheel-like structures, to change their positions. Uh, and the wiring between the switches under each key and the lamps actually goes through the interior of these three moving parts. And that's made possible because there are sliding contacts to allow them to occur. So every time you press a key, the rotors change their position. In particular, it's a rotor on the right-hand side, which will step on by one place regularly, and every so often uh, the other rotors will simply move. Each new position of the rotors means that there's a different a wiring arrangement between the switches under the keys and the lamps. And that means that if, even if you, uh, keep, so if you keep pressing the same key on the keyboard again and again, because of the motion of the rotors, you do not get the same lamp lighting up each time, different lamps will light up. I'll try to demonstrate that with some fear and trepidation, because this, if you get a bad contact, you get a, nothing happens. And that uh, the machine is of some age, it doesn't always work. But let's try and see. I'll press down on the key for letter B. You should see the rotor on this side step on the one place, and hopefully a lamp will light up. Well, it has. And on that particular occasion, I'm keeping the key pressed down, I'm pressing down on key B, 
and it's letter A that is actually being illuminated. So you could say that at that particular moment, the letter B had been in cipher to A. But if I press the key again, the same key, it's now letter E that's lit up. And if I press it again, it's now letter Y that's lit up. So, in general, every time you press even the same key, you get a different cipher letter generated. So, that means that if you've got a, a piece of plain text that's being enciphered, each time the letter B appeared in a message, if it did, in several positions, it will be enciphered to a different letter. And of course, that, doesn't just, that remark isn't just restricted to the letter B, it would apply to any letter in the message. And the result is a, what is called a polyalphabetic cipher, that each letter of plain text can be represented by a multiplicity of other letters. And of course, that makes the life pretty tough for the person who's trying to break it. <laughs> now, when the machine was in, uh, in operational use, um, the, uh, there were usually three people involved, uh, two Enigma <coughs> operators and a wireless operator. And the procedure would be that given a, a piece of plain text, a message to encipher, uh, uh, one of the Enigma operators would sit at the machine and would enter the message letter by letter on the keyboard. And his colleague would sit alongside him with an appropriate notepad and would make a careful note of the identity of the letters that were illuminated by the lamps, one by one. And when they'd completed that task, if, they were, if the message had, say, 150 letters in it, uh, there would be 150 illuminations of the lamp corresponding to it, and those, that sequence would be the ciphertext. And the ciphertext would be given to the wireless operator, who would then transmit it. Wireless telegraphy, but using Stanford International Morse code, which uh, ironically was used by all countries, you see. So there was no difficulty about that. However, before the message was actually entered on the keyboard, letter by letter, the operators had to make sure the machine was set up in a particular way, uh, which was known as the key for that day. And uh, to explain that, I'm not going to do any massive changes to this machine this morning because it's, uh, I keep apologising for it in a way, it is a museum piece and we try to minimise the wear and tear that these things get subjected to. But uh, uh, what you can do, for example, is take the rotors out of the machine and you can put them back in a different order, a different arrangement, and that changes the nature of the cipher. Uh, moreover, the operators of the Army and Air Force uh, were equipped with five rotors, each electrically different in its characteristics, and so on a given day, under instructions, they would select three from the five that were available, and then put those three that had been selected in the machine in a prescribed order. And if you go to the mathematics of that, uh, there are 60 <coughs> possible combinations that you could use, any one of those might be used. Uh, that was known as the rotor order. Now, the rotors themselves could then be preset, each one, <coughs> to any one of 26 positions. Each rotor can go through 26 positions. And with three actually in the machine, that means there are 26 times 26 times 26 possible combinations of rotor starting positions. And if you work that out in your head, that 26 cubed, it's around 17,500, well, 17,576, I think is the figure, over 17,000. Now, there was another part of the key which uh, was uh, very formidable, and uh, something I'm not going to really explain properly this morning, uh, a thing called a plug board, this arrangement on the front here. It's a board with 26 sockets in it, and you could put plugs in, with the appropriate cables, the plugs are connected together in pairs by cables, and the, you could plug up that board in a large number of different ways. And that also affected the nature of the cipher. But I say, I'm really giving you a demonstration of the machine, I'm not going into the theory of it. That was a formidable part of the, of the uh, key, in a sense, because there are so many possible ways in which you can do that. So on a given day, using instructions they'd received in advance, they knew what they were supposed to do. Uh, this is a blown up version of what was called a setting sheet, and it gave the information for a month for the key. 
And I'll be perfectly honest with you, this is not, you need a bit more of an explanation. There's something here which appears might be a, a bit, a bit puzzling because it doesn't appear to be on the sheet, but I'm not going to talk about it this morning. Uh, that, that's for another occasion. This is just a demonstration. But that's basically all you need. So they would set up the machine for the day in the way prescribed in advance, the key, and then that process of justice for life would be carried out. Well, let's just try the thing out to see if we can uh, get a little bit of cipher out of it and then discuss how it might be, uh, that cipher message might be recovered. One thing I've overlooked to mention, when you're setting the rotors uh, initially to a particular set of starting positions, how do you know well, what those positions are? How are they defined? Well, each rotor has got a ring around its circumference uh, on this particular machine engraved the letters of the alphabet from A to Z, 26 positions. And when the cover is down, there are three little viewing apertures, and one can see just one letter on each of those reference rings. And then externally, the operator could turn the rotors to the positions that he decided he was going to use on that day. OK, well, let's, let's do that. I'm going to set the machine up to a particular key, and I'm not going to change the rotors. I'm not changing the plug. I'll leave that alone. The only thing I will do is set the rotors to initial starting positions, or the so sometimes called the message setting. And I'm going to use something very simple and obvious, ABC. That'll do. So um, I'll make sure this rotor is on position A. It's not. It's, it's, it was on B originally. This one's got to be moved a bit. This one to go to B, and this one to C. Okay, so we're on A, B, C. And now we need a message. 